headed out to the jungle one last time, determined to find our bad guys. We had a hunch they'd be revving their chainsaws at the end of the road. know what to expect when we got to the end of the road. We imagined survey teams, lots of heavy machinery, but it wasn't like that. Turned out there was only one bulldozer and its operator was the only member of the survey team. Which way the road went pretty much depended on what kind of mood he was in. Antonio told us he'd been doing about a kilometer a month this way for the last couple years. The actual cutting doesn't take place until after the gravel is laid and the road is completed. That's when the timber companies can bring skidders in to drag the trees out of the forest. Trees, like Colono Jose Madron, have been anxious to cut down and sell for the standard $5 a tree. As we expected, it was Jose and his sons, not the timber companies, who actually owned the chainsaws. But were these guys really the villains? We asked Jose, why had he come to the forest? We also wanted to know what he planned to do with his land after the trees were gone. Destruiré la montaña y luego seguiré con los pastos porque no me queda más otro medio de trabajo. Aquí ya que el café y otro producto es muy poco, más da es la ganadería. Entonces, la instrucción de la montaña que estoy haciendo es para rehabilitar con los trabajos de pastizales. Jose if we could film them cutting down some trees. He said it was their day off, but if we really wanted, he'd get out the chainsaw. Oil companies need oil, timber companies need wood, colonos need land, and camera guys need footage. Hey, 
On the way back to Quito, we talked it over and decided that it might be better to focus our story on Doug and Chris. After all, they were trying to save the forest, not destroy it. Unfortunately, the Trekasaw was still locked up, but nobody could explain why. Hopes were dwindling as rapidly as tensions were rising and it only took something like a missing roll of toilet paper to set things off. Chris, if you get shitty with me again, you can go from my house. If you get shitty and talk to me like that, you can leave my house and stay in the hotel. And I'm serious. I've had enough of your bad mood. I'm living through this too. This is my house with 15 people. You don't speak to me like that in my house or I'll knock you flat. Okay? Okay. Don't forget, next time you'll be on your back. Either sustainable forestry wasn't ready for Ecuador, or Ecuador wasn't quite ready for sustainable forestry. Either way, it looked like we might not get an upbeat ending for our story. Within a week, Clive, Lucinda, and Chris 
all went home. Doug and Marta turned their attentions to other projects. They didn't seem too surprised at the way things had turned out. The situation socially, ecologically and politically is so complex that most people end up just getting burnt out. There's a limit to, to what most people can do at ground level when they feel that you know, what they're working for, their vision just doesn't seem to have a hope of being realised, well, people, people go. You know? Or go and look for, as they say, greener pastures. You know? <laughs> While waiting for our flight, we met Jonathan from California. He had just changed his name to Sparrow and was on his way to the Rainforest Information Center. I think it's a very urgent need for people to do all they can to help save the rainforest of the world. Scientists estimate that within 50 years, they'll all be gone. We are the last generation of humans on Earth who have a chance to save these priceless ecosystems. That is why I've come to Ecuador, because I want to save, I want to help save the richest biological... We wished him luck, paid our $20 exit fee, and went home. After Ecuador, we tried being regular camera guys again, but somehow it had lost its glamour. And now, if you pass a little gas, don't be embarrassed, because that's the purpose of the exercise. And you smell some gas. Maybe it was that sign on top of the Hard Rock Cafe, or maybe we were just different. Either way, we still felt we had to do something. The only problem was we didn't know what. We tried planting trees, but it didn't seem like enough. We sent a donation to a rainforest group, but just ended up with a forest of literature and pleas for more money. We even tried raising awareness by showing our footage, but then people started asking us what they should do. What can everyday people like me do to, to help stop the rainforest from depleting? It was right about then that we met these guys from Greenpeace who told us they had something they wanted to show us. They took us down to the harbor and snuck us into a warehouse filled up with what they called the horizontal rainforest. It's one ply. It's pretty much like one ply. This is what's coming in. This is the rainforest right here. We're standing right in between. What we saw was just a fraction of the more than two million tons of rainforest timber that are imported into the U.S. each year, more than a thousand tons of which arrive in L.A. each day. According to Rick and John, 500-year-old trees were being turned into everything from door skins and umbrella handles to cement moldings and toilet seats. But one of the biggest users in L.A. were the film studios who were using this stuff for movie sets. Hollywood, co-conspirator in rainforest destruction? That didn't sound right. John and Rick swore it was true and said they were part of a large-scale campaign to put a stop to it. All they wanted from us was a little help in the video department. We decided to check out a few studios and discovered that what John and Rick were saying was not just Greenpeace propaganda. Our studio contacts estimated that the industry was gobbling up about 250,000 sheets of rainforest plywood every year, which meant 17,000 less acres in which to shoot Save the Rainforest movies. According to film producer David Zucker, the man behind Airplane and Naked Gun, it was hard to persuade the studios to stop using this stuff, primarily because it's cheap. One studio can't 
pay five dollars for an alternative while the other studio is paying two dollars to destroy the rainforest because the first choice is always of course to destroy the rain rainforest and save a few bucks but uh... Zucker along with others had been trying to convince studio executives to switch from rainforest wood to alternatives but so far little had changed people don't want to pay for it and and it's it's a it's a crime that's that's that makes me sad it's hard to deal with the factor of the hypocrisy that exists i mean they have these big banquets and for you know everybody to be a great environmentalist and everybody pulls up in their mercedes and bmws you know which get 16 miles to the gallon there's no business like show business like no business i know We went back to Greenpeace to find out more about what the guys wanted us to do. The place was abuzz with activity. You could tell they were gearing up for something big. Not only was Greenpeace involved, but so were Rainforest Action Network and Earth First. Well, on the banner, on the banner, Greenpeace is first. Earth First is in the middle and rain. When we caught up with John and Rick, we found them drawing up plans for something they called the ship action. Best we could tell, it was some kind of modern day pirate adventure. They had targeted a Korean freighter named Sammy Superstars. By best estimates, it would no doubt be carrying 24,000 tons of rainforest plywood. Okay, so it's coming at what time tomorrow? Four. Four o'clock. The mission was as complex as it was dangerous. A small unit of Earth Firsters would storm the ship, climb to the top of crane towers, and handcuff themselves to winch cables, which would prevent the ship from offloading its rainforest cargo. At the same time, John and his colleague Gaston would repel over the side of the ship and unfurl a huge protest banner. For its part, Rainforest Action Network would back up the whole thing with a dockside demonstration. Hey, Bill. Yeah. You know what we need from you, buddy? What they wanted us to do was shoot the action and supply them with dramatic pictures that would help them get their message out to the world. In a nutshell, they were calling for a complete ban on the importation of tropical timber. It was something concrete we could do, but the only question for us was, would banning tropical wood imports actually stop rainforest destruction? The answer is I'm correct. As we recalled, Fernando once said, before you can save the forest, you have to solve the problem of people. If we don't use the resource, the people can't use. So it's non-growing, it's... What he meant was that Banning tropical wood products might force timber companies like Indesa out of business, but it wouldn't stop forest dwellers in search of a better life from tearing down the trees to grow other things that weren't banned, like bananas, coffee, or beef. For Fernando, forests could best be managed by the timber companies themselves since they had a need to conserve their own resources. On the other hand, Experts like Simon Council of Friends of the Earth disagreed with Fernando. Well, that's, that's an, a superficially attractive argument, but it's one that the, the actual evidence, the historical evidence, simply doesn't bear out. Uh, this is the, the use it or lose it theory. I've asked representatives of the industry in the UK, for example, if they can, if they can show me one example where logging has actually helped to conserve the forest on a long-term basis, and they have not yet been able to come up with one such example. We could see the validity of both points of view, but in the end, it was this writer, George Mambio, who made the most sense to us. The first prerequisite is to reduce the amount of timber that we buy, and then we got to look to getting all the timber that we buy, all the remainder, onto a sustainable footing and an environmentally acceptable cutting regime. We agreed about the reducing consumption part, but questioned whether it was realistic to believe sustainable forestry could work in the real world. He said it already was real, and for proof, pointed to an enterprise called 
the Ecological Trading Company. The Ecological Trading Company, to my mind, is one of the most important initiatives there is as far as potential solutions for using the forest rationally go. It's not only a great thing for the people involved, because it's actually providing them with a livelihood which both protects their way of life and protects the forest that they live in, but it's a brilliant example to other timber traders of what they ought to be doing. We didn't have the heart to tell them that the ETC was as dead as the wood in the Hollywood sign, but we figured that if supporting a timber ban could at least help reduce consumption, then this was one thing we were willing to do. Action! It turned out that they really didn't need our footage after all, since just about every TV station in town showed up to shoot their own footage of the action. Well, the fight to save the world's rainforests moved to the harbor in Long Beach this morning. Why? We boarded the ship today to stop the unloading of tropical timber here in North America. Over. At 4 o'clock, the story was going out live on three channels and we expected it to go national, if not global. Will you negotiate with us directly? We are asking you to not offload tropical timber in this port as a gesture that your company is concerned about the fate of the rainforest. Why is what you're doing so important? What is important here is for each of us to learn to take personal responsibility. When we start going into our hardware stores, into lumber stores, we need to start asking where this timber is coming from. And if it's coming from the rainforest, we need to make another choice. All told, nine TV stations covered the story, but what was hot news at four had cooled off by six, and by 11, well, it was barely mentioned on a UHF channel. The next morning, the new sizzling story was the grand opening of the world's biggest shopping mall. Did you see the bear? I saw that. It's a it, welcome bear. That welcome bear was chainsawed into being. I don't know what that says about it, but I, I think don't either. Over at the Greenpeace office, however, the mood was upbeat. Kevin Costner's and Valerie Bertinelli's people called to announce that they would no longer work on movie sets that used rainforest timber. As for us, we were just about to finish editing this movie when a fax came in. It was from Chris. Not only had the Trekasaw finally cleared customs, but the Indian community had approved the management plan, and the first shipment of sustainably harvested timber was on its way to England. And guess what? So are we.
Can you hand check this? Oh, brother, don't hide and inspect anything. It's perfectly safe to go through. Are you sure? Because I might erase the tape. No, it won't. There's no magnetic field through this machine. If you take it through that arch, it's totally perfect.